this uh, talk from the, the story of Oscar. So Oscar is currently 61 years old, diagnosed at the age of 30 with this kind of a slowly progressing mitochondrial myopathy, having so muscle disease, muscle weakness, having tiredness in exercise and muscle cramps, allowing him to only walk for 200 meters. This is a genetic disease. So what we did, as we always do, we did this kind of a mouse model that carries the same mutation as, as Oscar has. And uh, this is in, in mitochondrial nuclear encoded twinkle helicase. And it, I'm not going into details, but it's basically accumulating uh, mitochondrial DNA deletions in a slow manner. And this is also actually happens in, in my, more minor uh, amount in, during aging. So we did metabolomic study. And, uh, and first of all, I think what is amazing when you look at muscle metabolome is that it's very organized. And, uh, and we really then started to pay attention that there was one metabolite that was changing its behavior, first positively uh, correlating with most of the metabolites, but then uh, now in the mitochondrial disease, as you can see, changing the behavior, to, uh, and that's NAD. So we decided then to, first of all, of course, why don't say, need to say to this audience that NAD is the bodily form of vitamin B3. It regulates hundreds of different metabolite reactions, metabolic reactions, and uh, it has four different forms, uh, NAD, NADH, NADP, and NADPH. So then you can increase NAD by different kinds of vitamin B3, and they actually enter the pathways a little bit different routes. And different, partially different enzymes. So it depends a little bit what kind of a booster you decide to choose, then how, how you enter into different tissues. And uh, for the mice, we decided to use nicotinamide riboside because it was currently at the time available for us. And what you can see here, if I have now, okay, yes is that in this, this is the uh, untreated deleter. You can see mitochondria that are this kind of circular. They are very uh, swollen in here. But after NR, we haven't done different kinds of treatment trials, but I haven't seen this kind of a quite remarkable increase of mitochondrial mass and also the, the, uh, this is kind of denseness, which is typically uh, typical for activity. So we then decided to do a small pilot trial uh, to, with patients who have the, exactly the same mutation as Oscar had. So we chose niacin, or I decided to choose niacin because there were so many tens of years of experience of its side effects, and, uh, and also it was known to, we knew that if you use doses that are decreasing uh, cholesterol, as that, that's what it's used for, then we are likely going to be having some kind of a physiological effect. And you can see that the doses are quite large, so I call them prescriptional doses, that this should be really taken by with, uh, in doctor's follow-up. Okay, this doesn't like me, so I'll use this. Okay, so what we found first of all was that there, there is a fly, <laughs> and also uh, a, there was a decreased blood NAD and, uh, and muscle NAD. And this, the first of all, what we, what we kind of expected was to see this uh, decrease in the muscle, but we didn't uh, expect the NAD decrease in the blood. When we used niacin, you can see that there was a large increase also in the controls as also as in the patients. But in the muscle, the control level didn't really increase, but the patients were reaching the same level. So it, it's suggesting that the, that the level that muscle has is, is close to the maximal, it's steady state. So what was then happening in these people? You can see that there was uh, not very much of change of body weight, but if whole body fat was decreasing in the controls and also in the patients, but we continued this for 10 months, so it seems that it was actually coming up again. And, uh, and muscle mass was, was actually increasing in the controls and in the patients. And there was a slight muscle strength increase uh, in abdominal muscles, as we see here, not in the controls, but yes, in the patients. And I have to say that, that uh, for example, Oscar has been now using niacin for six years, and he can uh, titrate the dose himself. So when he, when he has a certain dose, he decides to drop it down, he gets the spasms, and then he actually increases it again. So it really seems to be a clear dose response. Okay. And what was quite remarkable to me was that the liver, the liver fat was decreasing after niacin in these patients. So these are all the Oscar age people. 
who uh, we can see that liver fat was decreasing down to 50 percent only in 44 months, which means that in this disease there was a complete block of, or at least decrease, of usage of, of fat, and this was released. And this was happening also in their children who have, these are now in their 30s, who have some symptoms, as, but almost nothing, but still there was a, a decrease in the liver fat. And, but, and respiratory chain activity was increasing as well. When we looked at the muscle sections, there was an increase of oxidative phosphorylation activity in the patients, but also in the controls, you can see here. So you remember that muscle NAD didn't increase, so this means that there was an increased flux through muscle because we do see the increased flux of NAD because we do see the effects anyway in the control. So in this case, we can say that metabolism was, uh, when we looked at the metabolome, this is a PCA plot, you can see that the, before the treatment, the, the patients are quite far from the controls, but during four and 10 months of time, they shifted towards the control. So we could cure the metabolome, but we didn't cure any RNA stress responses. We didn't cure the original de defect, but when we cured the metabolism, that was curing per performance in these patients. So what happened to Oscar, six years in niacin? He called me, biking long distance, uphills are okay. Long hikes in wilderness, no, with, with the brother, he's also sick, and uh, cholesterol is normal. So he, he really has been gaining, gaining life back. So this is, I could say that then the niacin NAD increase is the treatment for these patients. They have an absolute NAD deficiency. So uh, we needed then, because I'm a doctor, I wanted then to find the patients who, who would then benefit from this. That can, do we have any kind, of an, uh, any kind of a test we can use to find these patients in an effective way? And uh, Lily Euro in my lab then decided to, to do that, and, and he, she ended up succeeding to develop a test for all the NAD forms and also then actually glutathione and, uh, from one blood, blood drop. And uh, you can see here the mass spec validation of, of this uh, test and then the mass spec. So now, because this is a Congress where companies are as well, so this is an Ahmed, uh, who is also supporting this con uh, conference, we developed this in then to uh, start up uh, this, this testing system. So one thing we looked at first was that what is the, the optimal source? So here you can see plasma uh, analysis and then also the uh, whole, blood, whole blood and, uh, and cell, cell uh, pellet. You can see that where arrow shows, that's plasma. So there's not really anything to be detected. Still, there are actually methods in the market who are analyzing NADs from plasma. We looked then, because we wanted to know what the control ranges might be, we looked at the uh, red blood uh, uh, Red Cross bl blood donor uh, sample. So we got those from, from the Finnish donors. And you can see here then uh, that this is now, we can see here NAD, NADH, NADP, NADPH, uh, glutathione, both forms. And the baseline does not really change in the males or female, but, but you can see that there's a lot of individual variation. But because of these ranges, we can now say that when we take a test, we can say what is low and what is high and what is in the normal range. So what then happened, we, had, we, we then also had this material of these controls that we used for the, for the patient study. So we wanted to then go back to them and ask that what happened to the normal people who were, or health normal who is normal, but healthy people who, who are taking niacin in larger amounts. Uh, not so great resolution, but you can see, first of all, this is now, you can see here, red blood cell NAD where they are taking 250, 500, 750 or 1,000 milligrams of niacin. And you can see that some of them have this kind of a rather mild slope and some are decreasing uh, considerably more. This didn't happen, for example, for NADP or the reduced form. So NAD seems to be the one that actually changes most, at least in the whole blood. And this is something that we are now using for the patients to titrate the dose, because some may be low responders, some may, some, some may be high responders, if you can use this kind of a term for this kind of a metabolite. But anyway, uh, to find a certain dose where we see that they are in the upper normal range if they are deficient. 
And this is glucose and lipid metabolism. Niacin is known to be associated with, uh, with glucose metabolic changes. You can see that the, the uh, HbAc, uh, A1c trends to be up, but then the baseline uh, HL, HDL is also is, is then also uh, correlating in that case actually with NADPH. This one is with red blood NAD. But it is the, is the glucose then dose is uh, dependent? Yes, it is. So when we looked at the niacin dose increasing, increasing up to 1,000, you can see that there is a, a before 500. This is now actually insulin. You can see that the, well, this is fasting glucose. This is insulin. And uh, it starts to increase around the dose of 500 and slowly going up. Whereas, and, and there's slight increase also in that. So 500 still should be. Uh, is, is fine for the glucose uh, metabolism. So, uh, redox metabolites, NADs and glutathione are affected by disease, but they are not affected by every single disease. So that's, I think, important. It's not, they are not changed in every single mitochondrial disease, and that, that's why we want to really measure and then treat them as we would, for example, for vitamin B12 deficiency, we give up vitamin B12 or vitamin D also if it's low, we give it. So this is just vitamin B3. Um, there starts to be, there is clear evidence for mitochondrial disorders. There's, there starts to be accumulating evidence from human studies, uh, from degenerative disorders, and, uh, and from actually quite interesting from Parkinson's disease. And I, just to summarize, I, let's say that if the bodily by B3 is detected, it is low, it can be corrected and, uh, as any vitamin deficiency.